Sanofi, a global and diversified healthcare leader, reports results for 2015. Olivier Brandicourt, hello. Hello. You are the CEO of Sanofi. Could you please summarize for us the highlights of your fourth quarter and full year earnings? So overall, I'm satisfied that we have delivered on our previously issued guidance. Genzyme, vaccines, and animal health drove our sales growth in 2015. Genzyme reported sales up almost 30%, and for 11 consecutive quarters, they have delivered growth above 20%. Vaccine sales grew 7.3% to over 4.7 billion euros, led by influenza, booster vaccines, and sales in emerging markets. Emerging market sales have boosted our overall performance this year, despite economic slowdown and volatility in some countries. Our sales in our strongest region, Asia, grew by 13.2%. And this was particularly helped by double-digit growth in China, where we have gained market share. In 2015, China became Sanofi's third largest country by sales, with 2.2 billion euros, up 19.5%. As anticipated, diabetes sales were down 6.8% by around half a billion euros, in line with the guidance we provided last October. Business EPS was 5.64 euros per share, up 8.5 percent at 2015 rates, and stable at constant exchange rate, consistent with our 2015 full-year financial guidance. In terms of our outlook for 2016, business EPS is expected to be broadly stable versus 2015 at constant exchange rates, and this reflects the investments we choose to make in R&D and SGNA to found our new product launchers and growing pipeline. This is also consistent with the targets we previously provided. You announced last year in November a new strategic roadmap for 2020. Could you give us an update? Over the last 10 months, we have worked hard to lay the groundwork of our future success. Firstly, in December, we made progress on our strategic objective of reshaping the portfolio and announced that we are in exclusive negotiations with Barhanger Ingelheim on a business swap. The proposed deal would allow us to become a leader in the growing and yet highly fragmented global CHC market. We've launched three key products to Geo, Prilurent and Dengvaxia, and the global rollout of these launches is underway. Also in 2015, we submitted three new products for regulatory review in the US, and they are expected to become the next wave of launches in 2016. Additionally, we strengthened our pipeline and concluded a number of significant new R&D alliances in diabetes and oncology. Finally, our new organizational model is based around five global business units which came into effect on January 1st. This will simplify the company and be a key enabler of our strategic priorities. It will also achieve savings, which we intend to reinvest in the growth of our businesses. You've established Sanofi Genzyme as your specialty care business unit as of January 1st this year. What is the outlook for Sanofi Genzyme going forward? Under our new GBU business structure, Sanofi Genzyme now consists of four key therapeutic areas, MS, rare diseases, oncology, and immunology. Genzyme has had a particularly strong year, reaching sales of 3.7 billion euros, which is up nearly 20%. A key driver of this growth has been the MS franchise. This has increased very significantly over the last couple of years as it has more than doubled and now exceeds 1 billion euros. Obagio, now Genzyme's largest product by sales, grew by 78% and became the fastest growing oral MS drug in the US. Our second brand is Lemtrada and it's increasingly contributing to the outstanding performance of the franchise and generated sales of 240 million euros last year. Sales triple in Western Europe, reflecting the continued launch progress in this region. 
And in terms of the rare disease business, full year 2015 sales were up 2.6 billion euros, up 11.4%. So looking forward, we made further progress with our R&D pipeline in rare diseases, and I am pleased to highlight that we expect pivotal trials for three important assets, Olipudas, Neo GAA, and Fitusiran to start later this year. Finally, in immunology, we have two exciting assets, Sarilumab and Dupilumab, which we expect to become cornerstones of this important new franchise. Overall, we remain very confident in the growth prospects for Sanofi Genzyme, and I would reiterate the forecast we gave to the market last November that this business will grow sales at a double-digit CAGR through to 2020. Sanofi says it intends to be the world leader in consumer health care. Why do you believe that the business swap you're aiming at with Beringer Ingelheim is a major step towards that goal? This transaction with BI is expected to propel Sanofi into a leading position in the CHC market with expected pro forma sales of 5.1 billion in 2015. Furthermore, this transaction would provide us with leading positions in several large CHC categories. Given the greater estimated enterprise value for Marial, BI will also make a gross cash payment of 4.7 billion euros. And we expect this transaction to close in the fourth quarter 2016. As I have said on previous occasions, dilution is an issue we would be very sensitive to. Therefore, we intend to use a portion of the net proceeds to repurchase stock. With this in mind, we have bought back a significant number of our shares since this announcement. Overall, the transaction is anticipated to be business EPS neutral in 2017 and accretive in subsequent years. You recently launched Tejeo, Preluent, and now Dengvaxia. How are these three launches performing? Good progress is underway executing on those three priority launchers. Firstly, Tugeo is showing early promise in key markets. In the US, Tugeo gained rapid commercial and Medicare market access, and uptake is trending favorably compared to the relevant diabetes analogs. Tugeo is now launched globally in 20 countries with strong prescription trends in Germany, showing the way for other EU launchers. Second, the Preluent launch is proceeding according to plan. Our focus has been on building awareness, gaining US market access, and driving adoption. We now have access to Preluent on formularies covering more than 170 million lives in the US, of which 72 million are with exclusive formulary status. Of course, results from the Odyssey Cardiovascular Outcomes Study will be important in shaping the future of Preluent. This study is now fully enrolled, and we expect the interim efficacy analysis in the second half of 2016 and final results in the second half of 2017. Thirdly, Dengvaxia was recently approved in Mexico, the Philippines, Brazil, and El Salvador. This is a historic milestone for our company and for half the world's population who lives at risk of contracting dengue. Regulatory review processes for Dengvaxia are continuing in 16 other endemic countries. You're a world leader in diabetes. However, pricing pressures in the U.S. have led to lower sales in 2015. What can you do about this challenge? The good news in diabetes is that there is no news. We delivered exactly what we said we would in our revised guidance from last October. As we had highlighted, sales of Lentus in the U.S. continue to be impacted by higher discounts as compared to the same period of last year, as well as an unfavorable mix shift to the U.S. government channels. For Tugeo, I'm pleased to see the encouraging launch uptake we generated near 100 million euros of sales in the quarter and more than doubled from the third quarter. Outside the US, Tugeo is gaining momentum 
as it is rolled out in over 20 markets globally, including Germany, the UK, Japan and Canada. Looking to the future of our franchise, we expect a US regulatory decision on Lixiland, which we submitted to the FDA in December using a priority review voucher. In Europe, the submission of Lixiland is planned for this quarter. We also have a number of new assets we expect to launch in the coming years. We have an agreement with Lexicon to in-license sotaglifosine, an oral inhibitor of SGLT2 and SGLT1. It is currently in phase 3 trials for type 1 diabetes and phase 2 trials for type 2 diabetes. We are also excited about our agreement with Anni to develop a portfolio of long-acting diabetes treatments, including a long-acting GLP-1, a weekly insulin, and a fixed-dose weekly insulin-GLP-1 combination. Finally, we recently appointed a new head of global diabetes. He brings a wealth of experience in our industry, specifically in the diabetes and cardiovascular metabolic space. What can you tell us about your pipeline, in particular the late-stage segment? We've got a number of exciting milestones ahead of us in 2016. We expect regulatory decisions for three products, including Lixisenatide and Lixilan in diabetes in Q3, Sarilumab in RA in Q4, the first product in our immunology franchise. Dupilumab has the potential to be a truly transformative therapy and first-in-class drug for atopic dermatitis. It's been given breakthrough designation from the FDA, and we have further opportunities in respiratory diseases, especially asthma. We are very much looking forward to phase three results in atopic dermatitis, a major unmet medical need, which are due in the coming quarter. Sanofi has a long tradition of increasing its dividend what are the prospects for shareholders this year based on your solid financial results in 2015? And what about share buybacks given current weakness in financial markets? We have both a solid dividend yield and a strong payout ratio. I like to reiterate our commitment to shareholder returns with a progressively growing dividend. Today, we propose to our shareholders a dividend of two euros and 93 cents per share for the 2015 fiscal year. This would mark the 22nd consecutive year of dividend increases. Given recent financial market weakness, we have decided to intensify our buyback activity. And so far, we have bought back shares for almost 1.3 billion euros. Olivier Brandicourt, CEO of Sanofi, thank you very much. Thank you.